missed it by that much. G'day everybody, well I'm standing out here in the observatory with the roof off and the sun shining so hopefully that means some clear skies tonight. Uh, after months and months of bad weather we've finally, sort of things have turned around a little bit and we are getting some more clear skies so I have been able to do some imaging which has been fantastic. And recently um, the target that I'm hoping to finish tonight I have been imaging with the Mead 10 inch um, and because it's a, it's a little known target, I don't think it even has a name, um, it's described as a bubble in the Simbad um, catalogue and there is a star in the centre of this bubble, uh, it's an O-type star um, which can be associated with creating bubbles because of their size and the, the sort of solar wind radiation coming from them but I don't know if it's 100% confirmed that it is truly around that star or where that star just coincidentally happens to be there. But anyway, I got put onto this target by um, Chester Hall Fernandez who's um, down in Christchurch and he'd seen a mention about this bubble, very hard to find any, any decent images of it um, and so he thought it'd be quite good to fit in the field of view for my mid 10 inch so um, that's why I'm imaging it and um, I think at the moment I've collected somewhere around about 30 hours of O3 and HA combined together um, and tonight my plan is to do some um, RGB stars. Uh, you can see I've got the dew shield on here there's no wind so that's great. Um, I do have uh, two heaters on here so I mean everything just gets completely soaked I have water running down the walls effectively at the end of the night and pooling um, at the bottom uh, on the ground so um, what I've actually done is I've got the shield which has a heater in here but that's not enough so I've actually added another strip around here and um, so far that seems to be working which is which is great um, I am going to have the other two ribs running out uh, the other end of the house. So I've got the Asgar um, 65PHQ with the ASI 1600 sitting on the CEM60 mount and uh, that is uh, finishing off a project I'm doing with a, a group um, of other astrophotographers from the Northern and Southern Hemisphere and hopefully at some stage you'll have a video out um, talking a bit more about what's involved there. And I've also got the um, Samyang 135mm uh, lens with the ASI 533 uh, mono, which I recently got. And it's got some um, optimum filters, just some 7, seven millimeter ones. And um, that is actually riding on the Skywatch AZ GTI mount in equatorial mode. Now, it's sort of pushing it a little bit um, to its limits because I've been trying to do 10 minute exposures. That mount unfortunately suffers from horrendous backlash and I uh, have seen quite a few videos about people pulling it apart and um, sort of tightening up the gears to try and remove that so I think I'm going to have to do that uh, but maybe if I um, stick to shorter exposures I might uh, uh, do better with that but it's experimental at the moment but um, so yeah hopefully we get a clear night all night forecasts are varied from clear all night to only a few hours and then back to all night so who knows? We'll have our fingers crossed and uh, hopefully can, as I said, finish off this target. And for the mid 10 inch, we've got, no, we're running Nina. So the ASI Air is running the other two and this one's running Nina. The sequence is all in. So we will get that going. <laughs> So I collected um, HA and O3, so hydrogen, alpha and oxygen 3. I didn't bother with any um, sulfur 2 because I couldn't really see anything coming up in that. And then I did um, some red, green and blue filters for the RGB stars. Now for the oxygen 3 um, and the hydrogen alpha, they were both a mixture of 10 and 20 minute exposure. And I'll, and I'll explain why in a minute there was a difference. Um, I did about 21 and a half hours of oxygen 3 and uh, 18 and a half 
of hydrogen alpha. Now let me just show you a 10 minute exposure of oxygen 3. So the area that I'm interested in is around the star and if you look at this it's pretty hard to see if there's anything there at all. It will just um, zoom in here and you can just vaguely see a bit of what looks like a bit of edge of a bubble there. Um, so then I switch to 20 minute exposures and uh, believe it or not, and I'm not sure if it's coming across on YouTube, it is this little bit here is a little bit more obvious and there is actually a little bit tiny bit there, but it's it's pretty hard to see. I think you can see a slightly lighter area there. Um, amazingly enough though, when you take enough uh, images and stack them all together, you end up with um, this. And so now you can actually clearly see the outline of the bubble and there's actually two sort of shells to it. There's this outer shell here and then this inner shell here and whilst there is a defined edge it sort of gets a bit ill-defined here but this is there's a lot of this is um, a sort of a, a bit of a mixture of HA and O3 nebulosity in here as well so um, but here is the bubble that's being formed. Now with the uh, hydrogen alpha this was a 10 minute exposure and you can see a bit more, you can obviously see more clearly these two layers here uh, and the bubble there with some of the sort of bit of background HA showing up. Um, I did 20 minute exposures because I think you can see there um, that there is more, I'll just zoom in a bit, there is a lot more definition here with a 20 minute exposure. So um, just quickly again show you the stack, so 21 and a half hours of oxygen 3 and 18 and a half hours of hydrogen alpha. You can see there's not much background nebulosity in the oxygen 3. It's pretty pale even though there's 21 and a half hours here. You can nicely see the two um, shells that seem to be around this um, bubble. And here there's a bit more background nebulosity in the hydrogen alpha. And again, similarly, you can see the two to sort of what look like shells to me anyway. The stars uh, weren't perfect and pushing the mead 10 inch to 20 minutes I was I was really pushing my luck. They're not too bad but uh, I wanted the stars to be nice in the background so what I ended up doing was reshooting the same area uh, with the sky watcher and using the stars from that for the RGB stars and that seemed to work uh, quite well. Now um, I'll just go through to show you the processing. So this is um, my where I sort of got to when I first processed it. And the one thing that it reminded me when I looked at this was it looked like an earlobe. And um, so I was thinking about, oh, it doesn't have a name and what should I call it? I'll just call it the earlobe nebula, uh, earlobe bubble. I shouldn't call it a nebula, it's a bubble. It's not like a planetary nebula or anything like that. So it's a bubble. Uh, I presume uh, in this sort of all this background HA around here. But then it was suggested, you know, what would it look like flipped um, vertically? Um, and that was something I actually did. And then I actually posted the original version like this on Astrobin. And um, I think it was Tom Gray on Astrobin who said it was either the ear or an eye. And in fact, when I flipped it um, vertically, um, it certainly did look like an eye and suddenly I could see what looked like a crocodile um, sitting here with the, you know, the jaws open, the snouts up here and then the sort of you know, way the crocodile has a bulging eye over the surface. Um, and so I thought uh, the croc eye bubble was a much uh, better name for it. I know there's a croc's eye galaxy but I guess it can share the, share the name, there's no harm in that. It's not another galaxy, it's actually um, just a bubble. So you can see there that it's, um, you know, definitely has got what look like two shells here um, with the bubble in the middle and it sort of carries on. You can faintly see it sort of carry on around here. As I mentioned earlier, I'll just bring this, I just took a picture of it to make sure that I could find it. But um, so here's the star BD114620. It was sort of related to the star. It's an O-type star. And then they refer to this name here at, for the bubble and um, there is a paper done this is MWP stands for Milky Way Project and they have gone through and looked for bubbles and bow shocks throughout the Milky Way and so this particular bubble has been given this designation. So let's have a quick look at a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and I know there's a lot to take in 
here, but let's just um, run through some of the basics here. So we've got the different types of stars labeled M, K, G, which our sun is a G type star, right through to O, which is the star that at least appears to be in the center of the bubble on my image. Along the bottom here, we've got um, temperatures um, increasing up to here. So these are the hottest ones. These are the cooler ones. And then up the side here, we've got uh, increasing in luminosity or brightness and also increasing in magnitude. So from relatively dim stars to bright stars. Through the center, we have our main sequence stars, of which our sun is one of them. So they're um, fusing hydrogen into helium in their, at the cores. And then we've got these other stars which are off the main sequence, including the white dwarfs, etc. Now, um, the star that appears to be in the center of uh, the bubble is an O-type star. So it's a large, hot and bright star. And it's about 15 times the mass of our sun. And interestingly, and something to think about when you look up at the night sky, what we're seeing are mostly these stars and some of these big giants like Betelgeuse, etc. So you get the impression that the majority of the stars, perhaps in our galaxy and in the night sky, are, are these types of stars, but they're actually not. And in fact, O and B type stars are relatively rare. The majority of the stars in the galaxy are these dimmer, smaller stars, the red dwarfs, etc. But we just can't see them with our eyes. We need telescopes to look at them. So although when we use our eyes, we think these are majority. In fact, they're not. It's these are the majority that make up our galaxy. We just can't see them. I just thought that was an interesting thing to think about. So I wanted to dig deeper uh, and learn a bit more about these um, bubbles. And there's this paper from 2019 by the Milky Way Project, which did a second data release looking at and categorizing bubbles and bow shocks in the nebulosity in our galaxy. And this involves a lot of astro amateur astrophotographers and citizen scientists as well. So, you know, a big input from, from people. Uh, they were looking, if I whip down here, you can see that they were getting images of bits of nebula here and seeing if they could categorize them as a bubble or perhaps a bow shock and if there was any star um, responsible for it. Now, it was interesting to read um, this uh, area here because I know that from the Sinbad um, catalogue that the star in the middle of the bubble that I photographed is a type O star. Now, it says here, massive O and early B type stars comprise no more than a few percent of the stellar population and star forming galaxies. But despite their rarity, because they have powerful radiation and very strong and uh, fast stellar winds, um, and with some of them going on to form uh, supernova explosions, especially those ones that form the super blue giants, um, they, they, the stars they fell sort of dominate the observed morphology of star forming galaxies. And in fact, because of their stellar winds and their radiation, that they're actually sculpting the interstellar medium and that they drive galaxy uh, evolution. So, you know, they may not be that common, but they're actually um, producing a lot of the structure, interesting structure that we're seeing in the nebula that we photograph. And then further down the article, where they talk about the galactic distribution of these bubbles and bow shocks, so said that the data that's been collected supports their assertion that the majority of bow shock driven star candidates and bubbles are produced by massive OB stars. So that's the type O and the type B stars. Um, I understand they're it's sort of referred to OB type stars because they often occur um, together, particularly when they're, they're both formed. So um, yeah, so looking at my image here, I don't have a definite answer as to whether this type O star that appears to be sitting in the middle of this bubble is responsible for the bubble, but it seems highly suspicious. It's the right kind of star that seems at least visually to be in the right place. I, I don't know the exact distance of this bubble from Earth, and I don't know the exact distance of this star. I mean, it's possible that they're in completely different, they're at completely different distances and they just happen to look this way, but uh, it is interesting that there is a type O star sitting right in the middle of this um, bubble which seems to have uh, two outer shells. So I hope you found that um, a bit of an interesting video about our stars, the types of stars, type O stars and the formation of bubbles. 
etc. And uh, look, if you did so, um, give the video a, a thumbs up. That would be great. And uh, if you're new to the channel and you want to see some more of videos that I'm going to make in the future or, you know, check out some of the older ones, um, hit the subscribe button. That would help the channel as well. And until the next video, I shall leave, shall leave you with my image.